Hey guys, we're going to be taking a look at the skin, which is known as the integumentary system. Uh, probably the most complex organ system of the entire body. It's not just a single organ, it works in many different arenas. So we're going to take a look at an overview of just some th expectations for this chapter. Uh, overall, what are what is the skin uh, responsible for? Some general functions. I'm going to be talking about the different layers, and this is where you're going to get really detailed. I want to caution you. You're going to be listing the five layers of the epidermis, and then talk about each uh, specific layer in their functions. We're going to be talking about uh, specialized cells now within the epidermis, um, and, and you'll see that as we go through the different things. So it's not just what the layers are, but the specialized cells found within the epidermis. Then we're going to go down to the dermis and do the same game, uh, go through the different layers of the, epiderm of the dermis itself and the specialized functions and cells that we find in there. Then we're going to shift gears and we're going to go into uh, some disorders. And we're going to get into the cause, symptoms, and treatments, how you know you've got it, and what, how you might treat it and so on. Um, we're going to be, um, that's just common skin disorders that we hear of. We're going to be talking about how we use the skin to diagnose um, based on different things uh, like skin colors and so on. Um, a patient would come in and present with a certain uh, skin tone or coloration and what that might mean clinically. Um, then we're going to be talking about cancer and skin cancer is obviously going to be very um, uh, very relevant to us. It's the number one form of cancer that we find uh, in the human population. And also we'll talk about the P53 gene in there. So we'll hit some things about burns and things like that too. Um, and, and that's going to be the general expectations for this chapter. So let's get into it, taking a look at some of the uh, things about the skin and we'll hit on those topics as we go. The skin itself is actually, a, like I said, it is an organ system because it is more than one type of tissue. Um, it, it includes the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. It has all of those. So it is a very complex system, um, specialized cells, uh, multiple specialized cells as we go. And so in general, your skin functions as a barrier. And these are common sense things, guys, but a lot of people fumble on this when I have, say, maybe list seven functions of the skin and all you can think of is what well, it protects us is like but what does that mean so it's a it protects us in that it serves as a barrier against water loss or water you know coming in or water leaving us it serves as a barrier for bacteria um, because we have dry and um, dry skin and it serves as an acid mantle it does have like an oil thing uh, layer that goes around there as well. Um, so it's bactericidal in many of the conditions. It's a barrier against UV radiation. It's a barrier um, that does selectively allow some things in, like some fat soluble vitamins can be absorbed in through the skin. Um, even some toxins are, are able to go through that skin. So it serves as a barrier, but it's certainly not sealed shut against everything. It's designed to be uh, allow certain things in. And this is the way we want to go with medicine, is try to get some kinds of medicine or some uh, you know, vitamins or whatever, um, some substances in through the skin if we can structure them such a way. So think about uh, even like birth control or the nicotine patch. Um, some of those therapies can be absorbed directly through and that's actually by design. Now we take a look, it is also a site for synthesizing vitamin D. It's for sensory and it senses lots of things. There's lots of there. Um, we have sensors for hot and cold. We have sensors for just pressure in general. Um, different senses of touch. It's actually highly complex. Um, kind of concept and you'd have to go into the special senses um, chapter to take a look look what we might mean by that. Um, we have different textures, we have sense of injury um, and vibrations and so on. Um, there's other things that your skin does and involves uh, with thermal regulation. Certainly it helps to cool us off um, by just evaporation, but also it has a, a thermal regulation within the skin itself for dilating down or constricting um, the the uh, blood vessels themselves to either cool you off or warm you up. And also think about it in terms of uh, the social functions. We are social creatures. We're visual creatures. We communicate a lot through um, just social interactions and reading people's faces, which is why I actually include my face as we're going through this, because social interactions is a huge form of communication. Certainly we use it for negative things like uh, we, we prejudge and have prejudices for some things, but that is actually a natural function to, to, be looking for visual cues for communication as well. And so awkward uh, conversations are when you can't see a person at all. So it, it, it's good and bad and just being aware of that. Now, I just want to make sure we're clear on one thing that the concept of goosebumps, because you see that within the skin itself, that is actually just, I would call it more of a vestigial type of organ. Um, we have these muscles that will pull on the hair follicles to trap air. But the truth is that does not do anything for warming. Um, it's just one of those kind of throwbacks for when 
when he had way thicker hair and so on. So goosebumps are a throwback. Uh, it's not really a warming mechanism or anything like that anymore. Um, it's not effective. So let's jump into the epidermis itself. Remember, one of the things you're going to have to do is tell me the different layers, uh, stratum basal, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and then corium going from the bottom to the top. The most superficial is up the top. And you're going to be taking a look at what each layer does. Okay. So going from deep to superficial, it's important to realize that in the epidermis, every single layer has these types of cells, specialized cells called keratinocytes. Keratin is a waterproofing type of protein, and there's uh, those cells will make that protein um, at every single layer. So make sure we're understanding that when we talk about specialized um, cells and which layer they live in, we find keratinocytes in every layer. Now, the stratum basal is your layer. It's only one cell layer thick of just cranking out brand new cells. Okay. So if you get a scratch down there, an insult, uh, tragic, uh, something that gets down and, and cuts that away, you can heal that relatively quickly. And that's a mitosis layer. It is also the layer that's going to be responsible for secreting melanin. Melanin is the darker, uh, skin coloration uh, that, that gives you kind of your summer tans and so on. Melanocytes are the cells that make those. They're found in the stratum basal. Now, what that means is uh, with the melanocytes, they shut off during a certain, if you don't have enough intense uh, intensity of sunlight and, and so on, they just shut off. They go dormant. Now, everybody's born with the same number of melanocytes, um, no matter what your skin coloration is. It's just a measure of how how functional are they, how, how much are they cranking out the new melanin and so on. So that's all it is. It also explains why your summer tan goes away in the wintertime because the melanocytes aren't there anymore. And since it's at the stratum basal, you're getting brand new cells. They're just cranking out and replacing those old cells. Okay. And this is also a cell layer that has a basic, a very fine sense of touch. Um, and it's very superficial. So, you know, this is just something is touching me. We don't use it to sense or create meaning out of it. It's just um, the general sense of touch that something is touching me. Those cells are called Merkel cells found in stratum basal. The next layer up is stratum spinosum. This is a layer that, again, the, we, every layer, to be clear, has keratinocytes, but this is when the keratinocytes actually start to function. They turn on and they start to grow toward one another, um, and this gives a spiny appearance in the name stratum spinosum. They start to grow toward each other, making a bridge, and those bridges are what we call desmosomes. Okay, So again, this is just the keratinocytes as they're waking up and forming a network with each other, and so those uh, networks are called desmosomes. Now, this is also a cell layer that has an immune system uh, mechanism built in called Langerhans cells. These are cells that will wake up that present uh, a pathogen. So they're feeding off of, or, or reading, I should say, reading something that's in the skin itself that has uh, antigens, has these little uh, flags, the identifiers that don't belong in your body. What the Langerhans do was they will grab onto those and they'll basically, essentially they'll wave their flag, bringing the white blood cells up out of the bloodstream into that area and uh, allow the white blood cells to take care of that pathogen. Now, this might be that sliver that you get stuck into your finger and you just, you know, too much of a weenie to take it out. And so the Langerhans cells will recognize that you have something lodged into the skin. They'll grab onto that and the next day you wake up and, and if you haven't removed the sliver, then you wake up and it's a little bit sore and pussy and everything else. And that's because the Langerhans cells have done their job. <clears throat> now, the next layer up is called the stratum granulosum so-called because the cell uh, cytoplasm itself is grainy in appearance. That's because the keratinocytes that were waking up, if you remember making the desmosomes, they were grow growing toward one another. Now they're waking up and they're starting to actually um, kind of the starting maturity. Um, they're starting to produce that waterproofing layer. It is called stratum granulosum because, again, that cytoplasm is grainy in appearance. The next layer up from there is called the stratum lucidum. Okay, to be lucid means to be clear headed, to be clear of thought, and so on. So, stratum lucidum is this layer that um, the, the keratinocytes have been working for a while. They're uh, laying down the waterproofing and so on. And so, stratum lucidum, we don't see any of that grain anymore. We're just seeing elidin. Elidin is the immature form of the keratin, it hasn't hardened yet. Um, this is just that layer that, that contains it. And again, it is the layer that is just clear in, in nature. It doesn't have the grains within that cytoplasm. And then the topmost layer is called the stratum corneum, which unfortunately translates to horny. Um, the horny uh, cell layer, because as those those cells go this way, they're going to curl up as they dry. They curl up and they look like, you know, horns. That's what I mean by 
horny layer. Um, so stratum corneum uh, is the horny layer because it is there. Um, usually, typically, we have less than 30 layers of cells. Uh, might be a little bit thicker if we have, like, on the palms of our hands, places where we get calluses and things like that. Um, but it's usually a fewer than 30 layers of cells, and it's just there for abrasion resistance, okay? It grabs onto those things, and it exfoliates or disquamates as you get there. So, it, it, again, it's protection. Think about, you know, protecting you from blisters and so on. So that's the stratum corneum. Okay, that's those layers. And up at the stratum corneum, I just point out the nucleus is dead here. It is just there for protection. It's meant to slough off. Above that is going to be that waterproofing keratin. Um, if you remember back to the tissues chapter, um, we, we talked about stratified squamous epithelium, either it's keratinized or not. So this is where that waterproofing is um, <clears throat> that we're referring to with the skin. Now, within the dermis, okay, this is all the epidermis here, and we're seeing these ridges here. If it was, this was just flat, we get way more blisters. Um, it, it, just that top part would just be completely sliding off and sliding all over the place. Blisters are what happens when maybe the stratum corneum um, separates a little bit from the stratum lucidum, okay? That's what happens. Fluids will rush in, try to stabilize that. That's a blister. But sometimes we get something even deeper, like maybe a blood blister. That's because it's torn down in here. We've separated off the epidermis dermis from the dermis and so fluids rush in and so on now you don't want to pop blisters because as soon as you do that remember up on the top one of the functions was to protect from bacteria so if you take something and lance your way through those layers what do you do you just made a pathway for the bacteria so you never want to do that i know a lot of people do but the deeper the blister, the more painful it gets because it gets into the receptors down here. That's what I'm going to talk about next is the layers of the dermis itself. You can see the tissue layers right here is one, and here's another one. There's two layers within the dermis. The topmost layer is called the papillary layer. Okay, this is loose areolar connective tissue, if you remember back from histology, and this is an immunity layer. This is a layer, a um, lot of fibers, a lot of uh, just the matrix there to, to uh, you know, hold it and, and, and provide a little bit of flexibility or provide some stretch to it and so on. We also have the pain and touch uh, receptors. That's called the Meisner's corpuscles. This word corpuscle just means little bodies. And so Meisner's is the name after the person that discovered them. These are the ones that will actually receive um, the sense of pain. Okay, and, and translate that. Um, we have the sense of touch. Now, down in the lower layer, down in here, this is reticular. It's dense, irregular connective tissue. This is called the reticular layer. And this is one that's relaying on some of the really deep pressure sensors. We had some way up on top, if you remember, but we also have ones down in here. Okay, so those are what we call Paxinian corpuscles. There's also Ruffini corpuscles. These are the ones that are going to be responding to heavy touch and stretch receptors. Okay, so think about it in terms of the skin is getting caught and, and kind of twisted in a way or whatever, causing that discomfort. It's certainly there to make sure that we uh, are, are not damaging the tissues any further. Now, the one quick little mention because both of these layers the papillary and the reticular layers do contain these fibers because it's fibrous connective tissue um in in both cases here's loose connective and here's going to be your dense irregular connective tissues they both contain both layers contain uh collagen fibers as well as elastic fibers and so when you get stretch marks it's something that's happening underneath and that's either the muscles or fat tissue or whatever your body is constantly growing and changing but it can change too quickly so quickly in fact that it actually make tears in those collagen fibers. And so then it leaves almost scars down in the uh, deep portions of the dermis itself. If it was up in the epidermis, no worries. It gets pushed up to the top. But remember, this is all going to be epithelial tissues. There are no fibers in epithelial tissues. That's down in the actual um, connective tissues itself. We think about another topic that, uh, that comes up a lot is tattoos. Well, tattoos, they take a needle and they push it down. It has to go down into the dermis itself to deposit the ink because whatever gets deposited it up in here that's going to be replaced you replace your skin every two weeks so any ink and things like that it gets way um it, it gets a, a lot of the it loses its vibrancy it loses all that ink um that gets deposited up in here they look way better the first couple weeks then after that it kind of fades because you get replacement layers on top and really all you're seeing is the the ink that gets deposited underneath Okay, there's a whole lot of science with your skin that goes into the pruny finger syndrome. I just wanted, and this is just, I just pulled it off just for fun out of um, out of Wikipedia, which I hate. But it is one of those things that talks about the elaborate part of your skin actually being part and connected to the nervous system. In fact, we use the concept of pruny fingers to help to di uh, diagnose like diabetes mellitus or another one like a di uh, diabetic neuropathy, which is happening. Um, 
people with diabetes, sometimes their nerves actually start to fire, um, misfire <laughs> or they, <laughs> they, um, they start to just disintegrate and not break and break down. So this is actually one of the quick little things that they can do. They soak your fingers. And if your fingers are not uh, pruning up anymore, um, then all of a sudden we know, oh, we're getting some nerve damage due to diabetes mellitus. <laughs> now, we have cutaneous glands, glands that are found within the, the skin layers themselves. These glands come in different types, and so on the test, you're going to have to just tell me the different types. Holocrine glands, or in fact, I'm sorry, we did that back in, in tissues with histology. We talked about holocrine glands. These are the oil glands that are more uh, commonly found like with acne. They fill up and rupture. We have other ones referred to as ceruminous glands. These are ones that you find only in like the ear canal, um, making earwax. Earwax we think of as dirty and gross stuff, but it's actually antimicrobial in nature, and it also helps to make sure your eardrum remains pliable. Now, people with swimmer's ear, uh, for example, the water gets into the ear canal so much that actually the serum can't uh, build up. And so the, the eardrum itself um, becomes really brittle and, and very sore. And so that's just because your ears are too clean. Um, and so, you know, swim caps and things like that really help. We have other cutaneous glands and referred to as mammary glands. If you remember from uh, your histology chapter, we talked about them as apocrine glands okay they're the ones that are going to fill up and as they fill up they have disintegrated particles and so on so this is where like the the mammary glands making milk for for um lactation is actually good because then you get a lot of hormones in there you get uh, some of your antibodies and so on those are found within the mammary glands okay so we had holocrine glands we have the mammary glands and then we have our sweat glands okay the pseudoriferous glands which are maracrine in nature these are the ones that require um, active transport, so it requires energy to push the uh, substances to the outside. And these are good for us because they will uh, produce water to cool us down, okay, thermoregulation. There are some that are actually apocrine in nature, and this is actually relatively new um, in, in concept that we proved. I remember when I was just a wee little lad in high school, uh, they were talking in psychology class about the differences between humans and, and animals. And, and so we had a psychology sociology thing. And they were saying at the time that, you know, humans are just this advanced species. And I always took the perspective that we are of the animal kingdom. And so one of the examples that they had is like animals, they secrete pheromones. Well, now we know actually definitively in science, we've proven it, that apocrine glands are our pheromone glands because those are sweat glands, but it's more of a fatty substance, a uh, milky substance that's being secreted. That's only during times of stress or sexual stimulation that they turn on and secrete. What we're talking about is pheromones. Okay. And so that will occur in just natural areas that we would expect um, for being some type of pheromone gland, but we know that they do exist, not in every single um, culture, not in every single ethnicity, um, but they are there. Okay. So we have different types of glands that are found within. So when we take a look, we do have different glands. I'm not going to show you a picture and say, which type of gland is that one? We'd see some sebaceous oil glands for lining that hair. We'd find some other ones for cooling and so on. Um, don't worry about that so much, but make sure you're familiar with the tep, um, with the terminology. Now, there is one more layer down to the uh, beyond the dermis itself, and that's going to be the hypodermis. And this is the area that's going to be connecting the skin to the muscle itself. So it's going to be a lot of fibers and so on. This is also the area that contains our subcutaneous fat. Okay, so we've got some different things um, that the skin has for compositions. Let's talk real quickly about skin coloration and I'll cut it off and then we'll take a look at some disorders and skin cancer in the second lecture. Okay, so your skin will actually be, the normal coloration of your skin is controlled by three things. And this leads to all the different types of colorations that are out there. Um, so it's dealing with the amount of hemoglobin in your blood. So this provides more of a reddish hue. We have the melanin, which we mentioned before, that's going to be kind of the brownish tannish. And then we have carotene. Be careful. It's not carotene but with a K. This is carotene, which is orange in nature. So we think about those combinations. This is why we have so many different skin um, um, tones out there and, and colorations that are out there because we have so many different permutations of how much of each of these things as we go. Now, carotenes is the color you'd expect when you see the term word carrot right in there. It's going to be the orangish hue. So we control that naturally by those things. 
So what if somebody comes in with skin that's just a little bit different? And so we, we take a look at the color. Somebody comes in with blue skin, and we've always seen this, you know, somebody around their uh, eyelids or on their lips or under their, on their fingernails that looks blue. That person might be cyanotic. They might have cyanosis. That's an indication that they have low uh, blood oxygen. Okay, their lungs aren't working right, not getting enough oxygen. Now, this is also a symptom, strangely enough, in people that are really, really, really cold. Okay, they've been uh, hypothermic, or maybe they're just out swimming when it's uh, they just get too cold. You see a little kid and they're shivering, and their lips are blue. You tell them you got to get out of the water because they're getting too cold, and they say, "Oh, I'm not too cold," and even though they're shivering, well. The reason that happens for those people that are really cold, um, gases, blood gases, never do leave the solution. So the, the blood gases get really constricted down. They never dump off into the tissue, so it gives a blue color too. But this is cyanosis when a person has blue uh, skin coloration. It's an indication that their blood oxygen is low. So on the test, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe say a patient comes in presenting with blue skin. Okay, Then you're going to say that person is, has cyanosis and their lungs aren't working, so they have low blood oxygen. That's I'm going to ask that one. Now, taking a look, a person might present just red or flushed in coloration. So a person that's perpetually just red tonation to their skin, um, that's a sign that they might have arrhythma. Okay. Arrhythma is, is increased blood flow, increased blood flow blood pressure and so on. And so we want to watch that. Now you think about somebody that's really hot, their uh, blood vessels are dilated and everything that makes their skin a little bit reddish because the blood vessels are so high. Um, are, or so wide open, I should say, um, you know, things like that. Now it's ironic too. Also when they have, or get, think about red skin, you think about somebody that, um, is blushing. There are certain ethnicities that just don't blush. I'm obviously Scandinavian, very white. Um, but it's just one of those things that we're, we're horrible for blushing. Um, it's just kind of part of it. We don't understand why that mechanism works that way. Um, but this is actually a disorder where we're talking about more increased blood flow than anything else. A person might appear yellow in nature. And so, I've seen it even in cases of the whites of their eyes being yellow. And this means or suggests that they have jaundice. Okay. Now, this is because your liver is supposed to be breaking down the blood um, and, and therefore also breaking down the hemoglobin. And if they don't, if the liver isn't functioning right or correctly, um, then the hemoglobin um, doesn't get broken down all the way. And so it builds up in what we call bilirubins. Okay. Those bilirubins are yellow in color. So you find this in babies that were born a little bit more premature because their liver hasn't fully functioned yet. Um, and that's okay. You'll find that a lot of times they're born with yellow skin. And so sometimes what they'll say is um, because the, the bilirubins are actually quite fragile, UV radiation will even take care of it. So they say, you know, rock your baby in the sunlight for a, for a while. In extreme cases, they might have little I don't know, little UV booths that they'll put the baby in. It's almost like a tanning booth for babies. Um, they're not trying to get the tan, uh, the baby tan and things like that. They're just trying to break down those bilirubins, okay, artificially. Now, a person that has cirrhosis of the liver, the liver isn't functioning, they will be having jaundice. And certainly that wouldn't make sense to, you know, somebody that has cirrhosis of the liver, like, oh, just go to a tanning booth, you'd be fine. It's just a sign that the liver is not functioning. Okay, we have one that we'll talk about in the hormones chapter, uh, referring to Addison's disease, but this is what we call bronzing of the skin. Okay, this is actually a symptom where you have perpetually tan skin. Um, JFK had this for a disorder. And so this is just a symptom. They're just perpetually tan. It's just one of those weird things. And so, in fact, in advanced cases, they'll even get on their gum line. They'll get really dark stains on their gums uh, from this. It's a sign that there is actually a hormone deficiency um, within the adrenal cortex. Okay. So it's a metabolism one. It's um, just with some hormones that are later on, but it's actually a symptom that something's going wrong with the adrenal cortex. If somebody is pale, okay, that means they're not white, they're not albino or anything like that, but they just go really pale. You know that they're, um, they're, they have pallor is what we refer to them as really low blood flow might mean that they're getting sick, might mean that they're getting, uh, getting ready to pass out or, you know, faint and things like that. Um, it just means that they're not getting enough blood flow to the, to the extremities or to the head or whatever, and they would have pallor. Now, what I mentioned before about being overly white, and no, I know the lighting in here isn't great. I'm not albino, but this means you are actually white, white, white. I mean, no colorations whatsoever. The hair is white. Even the uh, retina, or sorry, the iris of the eyes um, is going to be more pink in nature because there's no... Uh, colorations in there and no pigments in there at all. This person would be an albino if they have white, not pale, but white. And so that means that the melanocytes, they still have them, but they just don't function at all. No, no melanin there, which means that they don't have any uh, protection from UV light.
Now, one of the other things that you might hear about is kind of these weird colorations, the bluish, greenish, purplish, or whatever, that's referred to as a hematoma. That's the blood as it's breaking down. You see the blood vessels have been broken. Um, you're going to see the different colors as the blood is actually being broken down and processed when it's inside. Okay, so that's referred to as a hematoma. Okay, so we just had some overview of the uh, major functions of the skin, taking a look at the epidermis, the five layers, some specialized structures and what they do. Um, we see that uh, within the dermis, there's two layers. Make sure you know what each layer of the uh, skin does there and some specialized structures. And then we finished up by just taking a look at some of the common um, the con factors contributing to skin coloration. And then what happens if um, they present with a different color, you can assign a, a different disorder to it and actually explain a little bit of what's going on in the body. Okay, that sums up for uh, number one here, and then we'll move on into number two when we're taking a look at disorders, including skin cancer and so on.